Now we would like to ask Deborah Feldman to read from her book, Unorthodox. Deborah was brought up in Satmar in an ultra-orthodox Chasidic community in Brooklyn, and her book, Unorthodox, from 2012, is sort of an autobiography and became quickly a bestseller. Her second book, Exodus, was published in 2014, and she now lives in Berlin. So Actually, we, we can also here. sit on here. Yeah. <laughs> where, where, where will you sit? Okay. So sure. You just sit down here. Yep. Guten Abend. Ähm, ich kann, ähm, sa ähm, da ich schon anderthalb Jahre hier in Berlin lebe, kann ich schon Deutsch sprechen, also nicht perfekt, aber ich kann. Und ich wollte erst mal fragen, ob es für euch alle besser wäre, wenn ich auf Deutsch vorlese. Und wenn ja, dann Hand ho Hände hoch. Und äh, wenn es besser auf Englisch, dann... Also, Deutsch ist die Mehrheit. Ähm <lacht> Haben wir auch Übersetzung vom, äh, wenn sie Deutsch liest, ins Englische? Genau. Ja, es ja, gibt okay, okay. Ja. Und ähm, bitte entschuldigt ähm, ihr noch meinen Fehler, ist noch nicht perfekt. <lacht> Bobby, was bedeutet Virgin? Bobby blickt vom gusseisernen Tisch, wo sie Teig verkrepplich knetet, zu mir herüber. Es ist ein feuchter Tag, bestens geeignet, um Teig aufgehen zu lassen. Über dem Perfect for getting dough to rise. The steam rising from the stove fucks up the rain splattered windows. My floury fingers leave smudges on the glass bottle of olive oil with this picture of an artfully draped woman snaked around the words extra virgin. Where did you hear that word, she asks. I notice her shocked expression, realize I've said something bad. So I stutter anxiously, and in response, I, I don't know, Bobby, I don't remember. I turn the olive oil around so that the label is facing the wall. Well, it's not a word for little girls to know, Bobby says, and goes back to rolling the delicate potato flour dough with her bare hands. Her pink cotton turban is askew so that the glittering rhinestone set into the knot is over by her right ear and a thatch of white fuzz is visible. When I'm married, I'm going to wear the fashionable turbans made out of terry cloth and piled elegantly into a square knot on top of my head and my neck will be shaved clean, even though Barbie says her neck itches all the time when it's shaved closely. Barbie loves to tell the story of how uh, Zaidi asked her to shave her head Two years after they were married, it was. He just came home one day and said, Freida, I want you to shave off all your hair. Husband of mine, she retorted indignantly, you went crazy in the head or what? It's not enough for you that I cover my hair with a wig, even when my own mother didn't bother back in Europe. But now you want me to shave it all too? Never in my life did I hear of such a frumkite, of such a religion that says a woman has to shave her head. But Freida, Zaidi, entreated. The rabbi said, it's a new rule. All the men are telling their wives to do so. You want me to be the only man whose wife doesn't shave her hair? New an embarrassment like that you want to bring down on your family? You want the rabbi should know that I couldn't get my wife to follow the rules? Bobby sighed dramatically. No, what is this Rebbe? My Rebbe, he never was. Your Rebbe, he never was either before the war. Suddenly we have a new Rebbe. And tell me, who is this Rebbe that he said I have to shave my hair when he never even met me? A more modest, devout woman he has never met before. Tell him, even I have a little hair on my head. Still, after multiple appeals, Bobby finally capitulates and takes a razor to her head. She always tells me, the shaving you think was such a big deal? Not a big deal at all. I got used to it so fast. And honestly, it's so much more comfortable, especially in the summer. It was nothing in the end, she says. Sometimes it sounds like she's trying to convince herself and not just me. Why did the rabbit decide that the women have to shave their heads, I always ask, if nobody did that in Europe? Bobby hesitates for a moment before answering. Zaidi tells me that the rebel wants us to be more ehrlich, more devout than any Jew ever was. He says that if we go to extreme lengths to make God proud of us, he never heard us again, like he did in the war. And here she always falls silent, sinking into reminiscent misery. 
I look at Bobby now, bent over her ever-present work and watch as she adjusts her turban with a flowery hand, leaving a white streak on her forehead. She begins cutting squares out a flattened sheet of crab-like dough and fills them with farmer cheese, then folds the squares in half to form triangular pockets. I drop the crab leg into a pot of boiling water on the stove, watching them jostle each other for space at the top. I wish I could take back my question, or at least say a good word to Bobby, something that would reassure her that I'm a good girl who doesn't use bad words. All I have Ever, all I ever have are questions, though. Oh, way, Bobby says with a sigh when he starts asking questions. Why do you always need to know everything? I don't know why, but it's true. I just need to know. I want to know about the book that keeps she keeps hiding in her underwear drawer, the cheap paperback with a pouty woman on the cover. But I know it's hidden for a reason, that it's a secret, and I have to keep it. I have secrets, too. Maybe Booby knows about them, but she won't say anything about mine if I don't say anything about hers. Or perhaps I have only imagined her complicity. There's a chance this agreement is only one-sided. Would Booby tattle on me? I hide my books under the bed, and she hides hers in her lingerie. And once a year, when Zaidi inspects the house for Passover, poking through our things, we hover anxiously, terrified of being found out. Zaid even rifles through my underwear drawer. Only when I tell him that this is my private female stuff does he desist, unwilling to violate a woman's privacy and move on to my grandmother's wardrobe. She is as defensive as I am when he rummages through her lingerie. We both know that our small stash of secular books would shock my grandfather more than a pile of chomets, the forbidden leavening, ever could. Bobby might get away with a scolding, but I would not be spared the full extent of my grandfather's wrath. When my Zaide gets angry, his long white beard seems to lift up and spread around his face like a fiery flame. I wither instantly in the heat of his scorn. The Tumner Sprach, he thunders at me when he overhears me speaking to my cousins in English. An impure language, Zaidi says, acts like a poison to the soul. Reading an English book is even worse. It leaves my soul vulnerable, a welcome mat put out for the devil. Yeah. Deborah, you want to... Join us right there, if you would. Here's a microphone. Thank you. Many thanks. Um, in your book, you describe the incredibly tight strictures, rules, and one must say oppression that you experienced within this very, very tightly knit community. Nonetheless, it is a very tightly knit community. There's a lot of closeness there as well. So I would be curious given the fact that we're talking about fragmentation, um, to what degree you experienced a sense of loss and to what degree you experienced a sense of liberation by breaking out of that community? Um, I, get, I get asked uh, about loss a lot, but I don't, um, I don't feel very much um, that I lost specific things. I feel only in a very broad way, the loss of identity, um, the loss of, of knowing who I am and what to say to people when they ask me that question. That was the, the most difficult thing about, about leaving. And for many years, I was no one and had no personality. And I adopted the personalities and hobbies and passions of other people to fill the empty space that existed after I left. I have found, I think, a very big chunk of my identity at this point in my life. It's, it's been over seven years since I left. And part of that reclaiming of my identity happened because I came to Europe. My community is essentially a European shtetl um, existing within American society in the middle of the most metropolitan society in America. But it is completely cut off from America and um, still follows European traditions, uses a European language, and has very European culture and value systems. So if you look at it under the perspective of a pluribus unum, 
you said, well, it's a European tradition, but a lot of people with this tradition found refuge in the US. Correct. There are also other religious group mm. which found refuge in a certain way in the US. So the general question, is this, may I call it a separatist inclination? Is that typical, or do you rather think that your experience is rather the exception in the US, and how does it fit all in the society of e pluribus uno? I no longer feel that my experience is an exception because since I published um, books in the US, I have traveled all over the US and I have met very, very many people who feel that they had a similar experience in other religious communities such as Hindu, Muslim, Christian, mm -hmm. Mormon, Native American, Hutterite, Bruderhof, there are so many, they're impossible to name. Um, you know, in America, freedom of religion has always been paramount, and this has very often come at the cost of basic civil rights. So my community was able to find a haven in America, and it was able to become as extreme and radical as it is because of the way the American society is structured. And they have definitely taken advantage of that. But at the same time, my basic civil rights were ignored and um, s s still are in a sense, meaning I never got an education. I never got a high school diploma and that was just fine because my religion or my culture said that it had to be so and out of respect for multiculturalism, out of respect for the religious dictates, it was considered okay that all these children born into this community do not get an actual education. But not having an education in America completely cripples you. You then have no access to opportunities and you're not able to join the society that you are raised in which means that essentially the system has trapped you. You never have an, any other option. You must stay in the place where you are born because that's the only place where you can find an opportunity. May I ask you how your family has reacted to your moving beyond the community? Well, on, on various levels. In the beginning when I left, of course, they tried everything they could to find me and convince me to come back. What changed was, as soon as I started talking publicly about my experience, I became an enemy number one in my community because the worst thing that, that communities like mine can endure is press attention. Because press attention then causes scrutiny and scrutiny causes change. So when I started to speak publicly, I received many threats from my community and from my family, and I received letters from my family asking me to commit suicide because this was considered the best solution to the problem I, I represented. Unfortunately, many people who did the same thing as I did, who left this community, did commit suicide because it's very often the case that they are, um, you would say in, in, in German, angestachelt, they are incited to commit suicide and eventually this is always in the back of your mind because you're constantly getting this message and when you reach a moment of desperation and of, and of hopelessness, you think, well, maybe it's true, maybe this is my only option. For me, crossing the Atlantic Ocean was a way to put distance between that kind of persecution, that kind of stalking in a way and um, find a, a, a real sense of mental quiet. So living now in Berlin, how has your view of the US and also about this e pluribus unum changed? I never went back since I moved here, which I think is a really strong symbol of, of my feelings. And it's, I don't have ant antipathy towards America. I just noticed since I came here that many of my fears have disappeared. I had very fundamental fears. When I left my community, I was a young single mother of, of a small child and I had no resources and no family and there were no social resources for me. I had to survive completely on my own and outside of the grid, I was not connected, I didn't have an education, I didn't have a way to get a job. There was, there was no way for me to really join the society. I was always on the fringe, always stuck in the middle and I lived in fear of ending up homeless. And I lay awake at night for many years and thinking of this fear, not being able to sleep. And I ended up s selling my body, but not in the way that you think. I ended up um, selling my eggs to survive. <laughs> and the fact that this is legal in America, that you can take a woman's body and, and turn it into a product. And, and um, I was pumped full of hormones that are beyond any recommended limits in order so that I could produce many eggs for an, a richer family to get pregnant. But the fact that I was so completely alone and that this was the only option for me, I think really says a lot about that country. I have come to Berlin and 
since I came to Berlin, of course, I was in a much better financial position by the time I got to Berlin. But what I have noticed since I arrived here, of course, I'm paying very high taxes, way, way higher than in the States. But I don't have this fear anymore. I don't have this feeling that one day I can fail and there will be no safety net to catch me. I feel safe. I feel that my basic needs will always be met, that I will always have a, a basic level of human dignity in this society. And that has that has really transformed my entire life and it has made it possible for me to, to do the work that I want to do and to contribute to the conversation in the way that I am best able to without being held back by this fear. Many, many thanks, Deborah Feldman. And we will hear more from Deborah. <laughs> <laughs>